Terry Karg, I'm the head football coach at Dodge City Community College. I want to talk to you about Grant Ciceroni. Grant is one of the best quarterbacks I've coached at the college level. He has outstanding work ethic on the field, the weight room, and with me in the film room. He has a high football IQ. He is laser sharp at the line of scrimmage, and he was able to check us into good place consistently throughout the course of the 2022 season. Although we didn't ask him to run a lot, Grant is athletic and has good feet. In the fall of 2022, Grant was an all-conference quarterback. He was surrounded by players on our offense that were predominantly freshmen. This speaks volumes with his ability to lead an offensive unit. I highly recommend Grant to anyone that wants a high-functioning quarterback in their offense. Hi. Coach Warren McCarty, I'm here with Grant Cicerone today. We're talking about his journey through football as a quarterback. Um, Grant, you have literally crawled through the mud for everything that you've gotten. You've had to earn yep. everything along the way, and it's been a wild journey. How many offenses have you learned at the college level thus far? Four. Four. Four different offenses. Yep. yep. And then dating back to high school and your senior year, yep. uh, which, which kind of began this wild journey of yours. Yep. Uh, midway through the season, you're on pace to break all of your school passing records. Yep. Best start in team history. Yep. You know, kind of led a team who had been four and eight the year before. Yep. Second leading passer in the state. And then we have a bad break. Yep. Collarbone injury kind of yep. negates the rest of your senior year. Yeah. Which ultimately led to a decision that's kind of impacted your college career because you had FCS opportunities. Yep. But chose to stay home. Talk about your decision to play for Jay Johnson and. Yeah. And, and the buffs. Well, Jay came into the school and, you know, I got to meet him and he talked about his offense and what he saw in me and what he saw in my senior year. And he was just, his offense and what he wanted to do was really attractive to me. You know, got, getting to stay home was perfect as well. Um, but he wanted to do NFL stuff. You know, yeah. the run game was all on us. The run checks all at the line of scrimmage, pass game protection, all that stuff was on us. And when he was introducing that to me, I was like, man, I could run this offense. It'd be perfect for me, especially at the collegiate level, you know, because nowadays colleges, they want to run RPOs, spread, all that stuff. And the ultimate goal is to get to the NFL. So if I want to do that, to be able to run an NFL offense at the college level, I feel like that'd be the best way to showcase my talent and ability. So that's why, ultimately, why we decided to go with Jay and see you over some of these FCS schools, you know, so. So one of the things that you did that, that I've always admired, because you rarely see high school quarterbacks do this, you're still in high school. Yeah. Parker, Colorado at Cherokee Trail High School. And once spring ball started with, with Jay and Mel Tucker and those guys, you drove all the way to Boulder mm -hmm. to catch those early QB install meetings yep. throughout spring ball and then raced all the way back to get back to your high school classes. Yep. Talk about your decision to do that and, and why you chose to dive all in before you were technically a buff. Yeah, absolutely. So I was playing baseball my junior year and I was going to play my senior year, but I decided, man, if I'm gonna play college ball, it'd be best to get myself mentally prepared and kind of see how they practice and how they operate, especially in the spring when it's less intense and more about installing the offense especially with the new staff under tucker and jay so i thought it'd be good to get up there and it was only three days a week monday wednesday fridays get up there go learn the offense and kind of see how they operate in the qb room and qb meetings how they install stuff how they watch film and break it down i thought that was more valuable than playing baseball at the time yeah. so i did that and ultimately it helped out in the long run you know i got there in that summer running and i kind of knew the install and i knew what to do and it helped me when we did player and practices that summer or sevens and Andy work and all that stuff. And I, I also got to see Jay face to face and he got to see how I interacted on the board and how I learned what he was teaching, you know? So you, you know, you, you learn Jay's system, you dive in early as a senior in high school, you've got that whole summer, that fall, and then yep. Mel leaves, takes the, the Michigan State job and, and Jay follows, yep. right? Chance to, to get back in the Midwest, which is where yep. Jay's roots are, certainly are at. Yeah. So then you have to go prove it all over again with uh, right. you know Carl Durrell and Danny Langsdorf and Darren Cheverini. 
kind of learning a new system uh, there with the buffs. What was different about year two and year one? So year two was different because you had the OC who was a receivers coach. You had Darrell who wanted to run an NFL type of offense. And Langsdorf kind of came from that background as well. And then you had Cheverini who was a Cliff Kingsbury guy at Texas Tech when he was there. And he was all about the air raid. So you're kind of trying to implement two different offensive styles into one. So that was really different. And they kind of created their own concepts. They didn't have as many checks. They still had checks in the run game and all that stuff. But it was tough because there was a lot of contradictions in what they wanted to do. And they had their own guy. They brought in JT Shroud. You know, they had Brandon. They liked him. But just kind of how they wanted to do things was very different in how they wanted to operate. That said, you excelled the following spring. Yeah. Right? Slowly climbing the depth chart and leapfrogging dudes with your performance and – that following spring, after year two, you're the highest graded quarterback in the room, mm -hmm. both on, on the field and in the classroom in terms of understanding their offense and their system. Yep. But still didn't get that opportunity, right? So yep. ultimately, that leads you to Dodge City Community College and yep. going the JUCO route where you finally get a chance to be the guy. Yep. But talk to me about the decision to leave CU and, sure. and where your heart was at and why you felt like it was time for a change? You know, that spring in 2021, I felt like, you know, I ran the offense very well. I did what I needed to do. And I thought I earned myself the right and the opportunity to go and compete that fall camp mm -hmm. with them. And they decided, you know, they wanted to stick with their guys. And I wanted to bet on myself, you know. Traveling wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to play. And I knew I could play at the Power 5 yeah. level. So I went Dodge City in the toughest Juco conference in the country. We yeah. played 10 games, and six of our 10 games were against top 10 opponents. And I knew if I could go play against some of those dudes, I could showcase my abilities. And ultimately, we wanted to get game film yeah. and show what I could do in game because we had a lot of practice stuff you know at the highest level but doing what I could do in the game is ultimately what I wanted to show so let's talk about Terry Karg's offense Terry of course is the head coach at Dodge City had built a powerhouse program at Monroe Junior College but yep. he himself played quarterback at the pro level in the NFL NFL Europe CFL and Arena League for, yeah. for nine years before he got and coached at the pro level as well what was different about his system versus what you had learned at CU? So his system was a lot more spread. It was a spread multiple type system. Mm -hmm. He ran more RPOs and stuff, but there was still a lot of stuff on us at the line of scrimmage. We set all the protections. We set the run game based off fronts. We did all that similar stuff. And that's really what I liked about it is I saw a lot of similarities with his offense and Jay's offense and what he wanted to do. You know, he wanted to be very balanced. He wanted to run. He wanted to attack. He wanted to throw. And I liked that when he wanted to throw the ball, he wanted to be vertical. You know, he wanted to get down the field. And we had the talent and the guys to do that as well. So that really excited me when I was going to run his offense. One of the things I think is understated about that Kansas Juco conference, not to mention the fact you got 85 dudes on scholarship, which yep. sounds like D1. Yep. A whole lot of these dudes, like yourself, are yeah. D1 bounce back players. Yep. But, man, you have to factor in, I don't know, I, th I think, you know, looking at the 30,000-foot view, people forget that at the JUCO level in Kansas, talent level's extreme. Very extreme. Week in and week out, it feels very much like an SEC, Absolutely. Big Ten type thing. Yeah. That wind and cold is no joke the second no. half of the season. No. What kind of adjustment did you have to make mechanically to deal with throwing that a different brand of ball, whether yep. a Wilson or a Nike? No. Nope and wind and cold. Talk, talk to me a little bit about so that. So mechanically it was huge. So I used to kind of throw like Kirk Cousins where I was more over the top and kind of leaning. So I had to learn how to cut the ball through the wind. And by doing that, I wanted to create more rotation like this, you know, like Josh Allen, mm -hmm. Rodgers, Mahomes, all those guys with the lead arm. So I really worked that. And then I worked my base, you know, kind of staying more grounded to the ground and staying attached and creating a lot of hip rotation. And just, I mean, throwing five yard hitch routes was tough in that wind. I mean, it was, it was no joke. It was unbelievable and then back to your point with the talent I mean every win you could get was you celebrated I mean it was difficult each week was tough and as you went on through the season it got tougher and tougher you know so you had to be mentally and physically prepared to kind of play those kind of games and opponents that would just get after you week in and week out you know so all that good stuff and then yeah just continue to work playing I mean we were dealing with the cold early early in the season you know week three week four we were playing in the cold you know in the wind and so you just had to get used to it but once you did it wasn't bad at all. But, but definitely uh, some mechanical adjustments. So Grant, we've, we've obviously talked about the high level of competition and yep. what that talent looks like in that Kansas Juco Conference, which yep. you're right, is the best Juco Conference in the country. Absolutely. 
let's take some time to break down some film. Let's there do. are some plays that you made uh, throughout your year at Dodge City that just were so damn impressive that I, I want to make sure that our audience and, and college coaches really get a good understanding of yeah. what your preparation was like and the things that you saw on the field. Sure. And I think we've got a good one to start with here. So we've got Coffeeville. Yeah. This is a touchdown on the post, but break this all down. Tell me what you saw and what you were prepared for leading up to the snap. Sure. So Coffeeville, their defense, smaller, but very athletic and very physical. So what they would do is essentially they would play with two linebackers and their third linebacker would be a cover guy. Mm -hmm. So their number one coverage was that right there, cover eight. We call that cover eight, and then we'd see that against a three-by-one look. All cover eight is is you're taking that nickel slash Sam right there who's over number two to the field, yep. along with that dog safety and along with that Mike in the box. Those three guys are playing cover two on number two and number three to the field. The corners are just playing quarters along with the free safety to the boundary. So hence, cover eight. It's yep. just four and two with a bracket. That's all it is. So we knew we were going to get that here. We were fourth down and about, what, 14 here? Yep. We knew we had to take a shot and get a first down. This was the first drive of the game. So we talked about it. We took a timeout before this, and we knew that if we went to this formation, they were going to play this. And essentially what we did is we wanted to attack that safety right there, that nickel over number two, and we wanted to run a post on him because he's just manned up there. Corners are manned up on the outside. Yep. He's manned up there. Dog safety, who's the field safety, is manned up on number three. And then the free safety, what they would do is he would kind of peak number three to the field. Yep. And he would kind of work his way over there. So you had to be very wary of that. Corner on the boundary was banned up there. So the thought process here was get my eyes on that free safety. Make sure that he Freeze him. Don't let him rob correct. him. Correct. Don't let yep. him come back and make a play yep. on it. I knew that um, the dig would take away that kind of underneath coverage and then let the post just uh, over the top. Man on man, one on one. So we did that, and as we roll the clip here, you kind of see that number one, Cam, number two to the field, just beats him. He's in a pedal, he gets underneath, and then the free safety, he works back, and essentially at first he wants to play the dig, he wants to play the end, but then he sees that the post is over top, it's too late for him. Man, let's, ro let's roll this one more time. This is the ball placement here is a great route. He kept the post skinny, yeah. but man, your ball placement here is elite. He kind of hesitates there, and then he's like, oh crap. Man, that is a great that's who, That's who we're attacking is that boundary safety right there because of that. And that's the reason why we run the basic, the end, just to hold him. Now, if they played quarters, which all quarters is, is you're going to take the, the nickel and you're going to move him inside and you're going to play quarters everywhere with your safeties, you have a boundary comeback to beat that. You just run the comeback to the boundary, one-on-one. -on -one. But that would be our answer. We knew that they were going to give us cover eight, and that's why we did it, and that's why we hit that. So Grant, this next clip is also against Coffeeville, and again, a nationally ranked elite defense. Like you said, really yeah. athletic, Very not athletic. the biggest uh, defensive unit you face, but yep. certainly one of the most athletic. This is one of my favorite throws. Now the stat sheet, you know, it's not the, the 35 yard post for a touchdown, but your footwork here, your ability to keep your eyes downfield, your ability to slide and maneuver within the pocket and still deliver a dime on the sideline, a yep. very catchable ball. Uh, under some duress. Yeah. This is one of the plays that, in my mind, is, is one of your best throws ever. Walk me through what you saw and what the decision was here. Sure. So the play call is all we're doing is we called it hooks. And most teams call it Hank. All we're doing is we're in left double. We got a tight end attached, two receivers here, 11 personnel. He's got a curl, OTB at eight. He's got a little out and he's got a curl. So they have a split safety look, middle open. So our rule here was middle open, we're gonna work the OTB to the curl to the back on a check release swing. Yep. If it was middle close, if he was down and he was rotating to the middle, we'd be working the field here and we'd work the out to the curl. So here, Coffeeville's number one pressure was this guy right here. They'd bring that Sam right here and right here, he's a big alert because he's capped by this guy. He's pressed up and he's peaking a little bit. So what I did is, Protection-wise, the game plan was to ID him. So I ID'd him, which means the right tackle's got to go out and get him. Then these guys are all handled. Those five are handled. This, the, this guy's got the back, and then if he came, he would be my hot, yep. right? So if he came and he came, then i just get it to the back right now. So as you roll the clip, you see this guy comes, he comes down, and I start in my drop, back pedal, ice here, and then I see the pressure step up, and then Cam does a nice job of adjusting his route from a curl to just working out away with me. So here you play it, pedal, here he comes. The right tackle's wrong. Um, he's supposed to push out and he's supposed to take that Sam, but that's all right. 
that happens. Back checks, and he doesn't get out, that's all right. You just make a play out of it. Okay, so you talked about this outside backer here on, on your, your slot to your right, and yes, you see right that here. he's capped. He How do you capped. identify these, these backers and, and who you're hot on? Sure, so we do it both on the field and our formation of strength. So here, we knew game plan wise, he was gonna be our Sam, that's how we wanted to identify it. So with him being our Sam, that made him our Mike, him our Will, and there was no Jack because they were in a four down front. So this is a four three, they got a six man box, right? Same thing with the safeties. Our free safety was our weak or our boundary safety. Our dog safety was a strong or field safety. So right here, you got Sam and then he's capped by the dog safety. So this is your dog, this is your free. That's how we identified it. So in terms of protection, I ID'd the Sam. The box was already, already accounted for. These four were accounted for. So this right tackle theoretically should fan out and take the sand when he comes. So I should be protected there. The back should be here, but I also have to understand that with the back taking him when he comes, I can't get him out in the route. So it's just really working this guy to the OTB. That's really what I'm thinking. It's really OTB one to two. And with this look, he's man on the tight end right here, and he's man here. And I like this matchup better than I like this matchup. A big, long athletic safety versus a smaller corner on a very good athletic wide receiver. That's kind of what my thought process was in this play. He comes, doesn't get picked up. He comes up, back picks him up, OTB's taken away, Cam works away from 21, and we make a play out of it. You can play it again. See where he comes, back gets him. And his job, what he's doing is he kind of he can just play me, and what, that's essentially what he does, and he sees me step up and he tries to get in my throwing lane there. Every, everywhere else is man. Man, 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 man. Boom. Cam makes a nice play there. Yeah, good, good round adjustment. Really good. This opponent is Mighty Hutch. Yeah. They entered this game against you guys as the number one ranked team in the country. Ultimately, they, did. they played Iowa Western for the national title. Yep. Much like Coffeeville, very athletic, but they're a little bit bigger. Yes. So bigger bodies, just as athletic, really physical uh, team that can fly around. Yep. This is a hell of a throw, this back shoulder here. Why don't you break down what you saw that week leading up uh, to this play in film and yep. what you were expecting here. So two things, the very first thing is uh, Hutch's base coverage was quarters, but that's kind of what everyone runs. So their base coverage was quarters and pre-snap, it sort of looks like that. But then the other part of that is their number one pressure, which was a cat. And they would bring the cat corner from the boundary every time. And I believe they brought it four times this whole game, which is quite often. So here, what I see is I see this guy in man, but he's peeking in and I see this dog safety who's slowly lurking down. And that's a big alert for Cat. So what he's gonna do is he's gonna come and Cat. He's gotta replace that Cat and he's gotta get over. These four are coming. This backer, this Will, is gonna take this tight end. He's man with the tight end. The Mike is man with the back. Now let's just say the back was on this side and the tight end was on that side. You just flip responsibilities. It's just all dependent on what side the back was on. But anyways, man here, man here, Cat, Man here, he's a zone defender, but he's an alert pressure because he's somewhat capped and he's peeking right. in. He ends up not coming. This is the guy. So he's just an extra zone defender. Man here, man here. So essentially what they're running here is cover zero, but they're trying to make it look like quarters. So what? He'll come. And so what we're running here is Lincoln Riley, A cross. So he's gonna run a go, just mandatory outside release clear out. He's a little out route right there at five yards. He's got the A cross and we taught it under the Sam over the mic. So he's underneath him, over him. So he should work here and then get across. And then he's got a dig since it's man. If it was zone, he would just run a post curl, pearl is what we call it. So anyways, we have a couple of MAs here. This week, what we wanted to do is we wanted to ID him. So I ID'd him as a protection. So they slid left and then the back should pick him up. And in this concept, the back has a check release out, but he should check and come across and pick him up. The reason we wanted to put the back on this side is because the anytime Hutch brought it, they wanted to bring it with the back on the opposite side. So if the back was on this side, they wouldn't bring it. So that we wanted to kind of disguise our protection so we could get them to come. So when he came, the back should come across, get him, and then he's protected if he did come, which he doesn't, but he's ID'd, right? 
So essentially what that means is if either one of these guys comes, I'm hot. Yep. And this would be my hot answer right here. This is the other part of the missed assignment. He has a five yard out, he ends up running a dig. I think he thought it was Y cross, but it was A cross. So he just got to come here and boom, and I would have banged that. So essentially he doesn't do that. So then I get my eyes here and I see that he's underneath him as you play the clip, but he's in phase and I figured just get a back shoulder ball. All right here he comes, he's in phase, back shoulder. And if it's incomplete, it's incomplete. You live to play another down, right? You have a couple missed assignments, no big deal. An incompletion is better than a turnover or a sack. Run that back. C4, man, 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 man. There's man, 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 man. Cover zero. You hung in there and took the hit? Hung in there and took a hit. If you go back and play it one more time, my answer would have been this tight end right here if he runs an out. He should, this will's head up on him, but if he just gives him a little boom and just run out, he would have been my answer. That's all right though. Big play, nice catch, first down. Okay, this next opponent, again, we, we keep coming back to every week in this conference is just extreme talent. This is yeah. top 10 team, Iowa Central, and this is a play where yeah. you use your voice and your brain to, to audible and get to something else. Yeah. Walk me through step-by-step uh, step how you get to a successful play here. Sure, so Iowa Central, again, smaller defense, more athletic. They were unique because they ran a 3-4. They were the only team that we played that ran a 3-4. They weren't a 4-3 team. A team that runs a 3-4, is a pressure team. They wanted to pressure the crap out of you. So you got your three down linemen, right? That's your odd front. Here's your three backers. You can play it a little bit so they can get aligned. Go ahead. There's your three backers. Sam, Mike, Will, Jack, right there. Corner, safety, this is your dog safety, free safety, corner, right? So what we have called right now is hooks, and you know hooks, again, OTB, curl, out, curl, right? Well, they're bringing three, and along with this backer, they're Jack, they're Mike, and they're Sam. So they're bringing six, so we're hot. So our solution to that was go quick game and get us into Lee or Ray protection, which is our quick game protection, and the back's gonna stay in. So we're gonna have five, and then six on six. Should be protected. Good numbers. Right, so I knew that was the case. I changed it, I went dragon. Dragon is just uh, slant, drag, slant, drag, drag, slant. And my thought process was play the field, there's more space, there's more room, and I could beat with him playing so far off, it's hard for him to have to come down and cover this. I didn't like the slant because he's pressed. If he came down hard and he was off, I'd want the slant. So you just want to attack the off defender with that concept. That's all we're doing. So I believe I went lead protection because the back's here. So they're all sliding left. He's, gonna, he's got C-gap responsibility, so the tight end's gonna release, and he's, got, he's basically re uh, replacing where the tight end was at. So he should pick up the jack here. So as you play the clip, I use a hard count to show where the pressure's coming from. You can pause it right after you, they show it, right there. See, he's coming, he's leaning, he's leaning, and then you can play it again. There they come, here they come. Replace the ball right there. Touchdown, first drive of the game. And it just shows that sometimes if you can just beat pressure with the ball, it still turns into an explosive play, even when you're throwing just a simple arrow route. One more time. Hard count. Lean, lean, lean. There they come. Boom. Touchdown. So, Grant, we've, we've shown some great examples of you really flexing your brain and your ability to throw the football. Yep. But the run game is crucial. Extremely. Not only at the National Football League level, but at the Division One level, being able to operate um, right here yep. between the temples. Yep. This play is from four years ago. It's 2023 as we're filming this. This is from the 2019 season. So yep. <laughs> your your recall here is, is super impressive to me. But walk us through uh, this play, your decision making, and the thought process that went into um, how you called this run play. Sure, so this is 12 personnel, and at this formation, we called it race. So you got your tight end here, another tight end there, two receivers, 12 personnel, me, back, five alignment, right? We're facing an odd front, so you got your three down linemen, then you got a double hanger look. We call this a mint SJ front there. Your mint was your three down linemen, SJ, your Sam and your Jack, SJ. You got your Mike, your Will, Safety, safety, right? 
So how we called it was race can Michigan check. So the check part of it was we had to decide at the line of scrimmage, do we go red or black, right or left? And our parameters for that were, the first parameter was away from a hanger. Well, that doesn't matter because we have a double hanger. The second parameter was away from safety rotation, afro, away from safety rotation. So he's rotated here, so what should I do? I should go black and go left, right? So we go black, we're gonna run it left to the boundary here, and then the other part of that is can. So can, all that means is I have the ability to motion this guy down to block him. We wanted to block MDM guys, most dangerous guys, especially safeties because they could tackle. We wanted corners to make tackles. So as you play the clip here, I get there, we ID'd, and that's the other part of it, we wanted to ID the inside uh, backer, but here's Can, bring him down, keep coming, go get him, boom, hand it off, pick up your five to six yards. You go back to the beginning, right there, pause it. So how we ID'd this is, it depended on what side you wanted to run to, right or left, and whatever side you ran to, you wanted to ID that play side inside backer. So here's your outside backer, here's your play side inside backer, he's the ID. If we went red, the ID would have been this guy because he's the outside guy, he's the play side inside backer. But we went black, he's ID'd, and you play it, the safety's down, and he's not disguising it, so can bring him in, he comes down, now he's gotta go dig him out. There it is, boom, pick up your six yards. Simple, simple. So Grant, why don't you have a seat and let, let's talk a little bit more about your body. We've talked yeah. a whole lot about your brain and you've been able to, to flex that part. You know, there's, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, Kyler Murray's durability. Yeah. And Bryce Young and some quarterbacks are super athletic and have smaller stature. And yeah. We see the big guys like Josh Allen and you're kind of somewhere in between. But I think one part of your game that really hasn't... Uh, a lot of coaches haven't seen you do because you've done so well with your brain and your feet, delivering the ball and making good decisions at the line of scrimmage. You're actually a hell of an athlete. Yeah. You're consistently running the four sixes, six foot two plus, over 220 pounds, hella strong in the weight room. Talk, yeah. talk to me a little bit about uh, the kind of weight you're pushing around and how you feel about your speed and athleticism. Sure. Well, your body is your temple when you're, you know, a football player, an athlete or anything. So it's very important you take care of it with your nutrition, your water, and in the weight room being strong and mobile. When I was at CU our second year, I mean, I fell in love with what we were doing because it was all about not only strength, but mobility and athleticism, being able to jump, run, stretch, and that because all that kind of stuff avoids injuries. It's not just pure strength, right? So right now I'm squatting four plates, 405. I'm benching just below three plates. So that's the goal is to get to three plates. And I'm power cleaning two and a half, so 250 in that range. I'm trying to get that up to around 275. And then I've been working with a speed coach, been working on my 40, my change of direction, my agility, all that good stuff. So I can continue to show my athleticism both within and outside the pocket so I can continue to run and you know make plays with both my arms and my feet and my brain, whatever I need to do. You know, Be a guy with every tool in the toolbox. All right, Grant, I want to get you on the board. I want you to draw up four verts, which is a super popular concept in, in a mm -hmm. lot of offenses, but specifically yeah. in the air raid uh, tree and family. Yeah. Draw up four verts. Talk to me about your read progressions, and let's, let's really dissect that play that a lot of schools are running. Okay, you got it. Four verts are bread and butter at Dodge City. And it's a bread and butter for a lot of schools for multiple different reasons. One of the reasons being it's good against every coverage. So let's draw this up. We'll draw it out of 11 personnel with an attached tight end, right double, Z, A, X. And we always, our Z was always with our Y. That's just how we did it. And A was always with X. That's how we always drew it. We'll go back there. Let's just draw an over front. So you got your tackle and nose in a shade and two backer box. We'll go Mike. Will, Sam is apex, free safety here, corner, because we're going to do quarters, the most basic coverage most teams run nowadays. Dog here, corner there. Now, I draw it up like this because the dog's always going to be a little bit lower than the free based off the fact that he, his responsibility is tied in here. So he doesn't have to deal with, with a very athletic guy or not as athletic. So he can cheat it and he'll be at about 8 to 12 yards. And this guy's usually 12 to 14 yards. That's how they do it. So anyways, four verts, MOR, get outside, and then you can run a comeback. MOR, boom, 
he's on a lock seam and the hash is right here. We'll say hash is right here. His rule is plus two off the hash. And then if we were to throw this, which we wouldn't in this look, but if we were, he wants to catch this at 22 yards. So he was taught to run and then just really throttle like that. And then the tight end, we called it a sloppy bender because it's really just a sloppy dig. So we yep. called it a sloppy route. He'd be here and then he'd do that with this conversion against cover two. But this isn't cover two. So all this is is quarters. Your back's here, check, boom, right there. And our read was simple. It was one to two. All this stuff was dead. We could throw this, but this is a higher percentage throw to the boundary than it is to the field. We're calling this the boundary right here. And so what his rules were, the Z and the X, where they had a decision to make at 10 yards. They had to decide whether to keep going or to break it off and run a comeback. And the rule was, if this corner was in phase, even if he was behind him, if he was, if he was in phase, he had to run the comeback. If he had beat him by one or two steps, he would just keep going. But every time against quarters, you'd run around the comeback. And this would be your throw right here. If for some reason your Z doesn't win, your back's right here. That's your answer. That's how we did against quarters. We'll do the same play against a different look. Let's do it against cover two. Same idea, corners are gonna be a little bit lower. They're cloud. Your dog's gonna be a bit deeper and wider, same with your free, because their rules are deeper than the deepest, wider than the widest. Right there. And this is where this guy is gonna run this route. They just call, we call this a pull route, because he's running to the goal post. This is no, he's not running this. He's still gonna run, he's not running the comeback now against the cloud corner because all the corner is going to do is carry and sink underneath. Get your hands on carry and sink underneath. And then now essentially what we're doing is we're going one to two to three right here. We'll put a Sam right here, apex. So how we would do this is we want to play the tight end here on, a, on the pull route and we would want to get our eyes on him right here. So what he was gonna do is he's either gonna come and get there and kind of take this route away. If he does that, you throw this. If he does this like he's supposed to do and take this away, then you're right up the middle here. Now, the only thing you have to be conscious of when he does this with him here is this backside guy right here. Because when your eyes are here, he's gonna cheat and he's not gonna get as far here. He's gonna probably be more like right here. So you kind of just have to peek this before you throw this in case he gets over here. And if for some reason, the dog's here, he works over here, there's your answer. Right there, just to check down. Cover two. Same play against cover three. Oh, let's race the whole thing. Same play against cover three. Same formation, same personnel. Right double, 11 personnel. We could talk about splits as well. Over front and tackle, nose in the shade, and Mike and Will in the box, Sam Apex, free safety. We'll call the free, we'll be here. Corners are off against in three. Dog will be coming down a little bit. Boom. Check. Over the ball. Outside release, outside release. Sloppy, conversion, lock seam. And he's really gonna sit it right there. So this is cover three. What's gonna happen is boom, deep third, deep third. He's gonna roll down deep third, right? And there's two different versions. Cover three sky in our, how we taught it was he's gonna roll down outside and play this zone right here, this hook zone. And the will is gonna play here, boom, boom. What the same was taught to do here is he was taught to get hands on the A, then work back down. That was his responsibility. Same with the dog. His responsibility is to work here, get hands on Y, then work out. Now, if you wanted to go three buzz, all you would do is you would flip the will and the dog's responsibility. The will would fly out and the dog would come down. And now the will had to get his hands on the Y and then work there. That's it. But anyways, in, a, in terms of progression, we're going one to two to three. This is the throw you want though against thirds. He's gone, deep third. He should be gone. He's gone. 
And then this is your number two, just in case this corner wants to fall off and play the seam. We call this, we call this a lock seam because A, there was no conversion, there was no roll, and again, he's plus two off the hash, and the reason for that is so his splits are good with this corner, so this corner's not able to trap and play both these guys at the same time. That's why it was important and vital for this guy to outside release it. And we didn't want this guy to do any of this or here, just go. Go and take this guy with you. Take him out, take him out, lock seam. If that doesn't work, because essentially what's going to happen is this free safety is going to have to come play down here. He's going to have to see this. This Mike's going to try to get underneath it. This Will's going to, we'll say the dog's playing out here. And this Will's going to have to try to get underneath it. And then boom. If these guys get deep, if they get deep like that, just throw the check down. If they kind of sit here like that and they want to sit around the back and take away the check down, that's your throw right there, this window. And we wanted to throw this right down the middle of the box, this being your box, right down the middle. So this is where he's catching it. That's how we wanted to do it. But that's if this guy, for some reason, gets here and then this corner falls off and takes that away. Nine times out of 10, though, this was the throw. Yep. Very really, the only time you threw this ball was against cover two when you did that. And this dog was here and he took this away. Four, four verts against every coverage, bread and butter. So we just got done talking four verts and then can I take you through another install, Peyton Manning install that we took, we called it Colt because of Peyton Manning. Great against quarters and great against cover eight, which we saw a lot. It's against the three by one formation, but it's very simple. That's so, awesome, let's see it. Okay. So all Colt is, is we're in a three by one formation and we're gonna do it out of 10 personnel because that's how we did it, a dodge. So here's your X. We're calling this left hash, so this is the boundary. This would be R. R was just the guy that came in that replaced the Y. So this is a receiver. A, Z, me, back. Same thing, we'll do over front and tackle nose and Mike's here this time since this is the field and strength. Here's the will. Corner, free safety. And now, this is cover eight. We saw this against Coffeyville. This was the pin play. All we did with pin is, you know, post in, but this is Colt. And so how the dog would line up is he would apex between the tackle and the R, and he'd be at about eight yards, so he'd be low there. This guy would be our Sam, but in this defense is usually a nickel, so we'll call it an N for nickel. He's going to be slightly outside of the A, then you have your corner. So to better explain cover eight, all it is is it's quarters here, quarters here, quarters here. And then these three guys are playing cover two on these two guys. It's a bracket. That's all it is. So this is, this is what Peyton Manning came up with to beat this. So what he did is he said, all right, let's attack this Mike. Let's attack him with a high-low concept. This guy's outside of the A, so all we're gonna do is he's gonna run a little basic at 10, under at five, under at five, under at five, check, swing. And this is what we're reading right here, the mic. He's our trigger defender. So we take the snap, and it's just a one quick, quick drop. Eyes are here. If the mic drops for depth, we throw this, because he already has leverage here. Right. This is your one and only throw. You go one to two. If the mic pushes for width, this is your throw. Because this guy is playing the back. He is back. He's not going to be a problem for this throw. But again, you want to throw this right down the middle of the box. So you want this ball right there. If they play cover four, all cover four is, it's the same exact look. The only difference is instead of a nickel playing outside leverage of your number two receiver, he's just going to play, instead of here, he's just gonna, either going to play head up or slightly inside. Corner, dog, free, here's your X, corner, knee, back, boom, check, release, under, boom, 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 tackle, and nose, and Mike, Will. This is your cover eight side, but this guy's telling me it's quarters because he's head up slightly inside. So I'm gonna play one to two, play the boundary. What you wanna do really is what you're reading is this guy now. If he pushes here, boom. If he pushes more here, 
you throw this right behind his ear. This simple. And this was Peyton Manning. He came up with this. They saw this coverage a lot when they went 10 personnel and three by one, and they wanted to attack it. They either wanted to attack the mic or the will based off if it was quarters or for if it was cover eight. Grant, I gotta say, I've been training you for a long time. Every time we get on the board or talk film, I come away even more impressed. Okay. Mm -hmm. The NCAA transfer portal's been frustrating. Yeah, um, killer. Seeing coaches transition in, in some programs to simpler and simpler and simpler offenses yep. has probably been a little frustrating for you. I know you have the world at your fingertips with your brain, yep. with your body, and your ability to make plays. You're a hell of a leader. I know the sky is the limit for you. Mm -hmm. What do college coaches need to hear from you? What do they need to know is within your heart? As a guy who, this will be his first fall, not playing football in, I don't even know, since I was 10, in a very, very long time, it's a frustrating process. And as an intense competitor, I mean, it's going to be tough to see all these other guys playing when you know that you're better than them and you know that you should be given a shot over them. So at this point, just one shot and one guy and one opportunity is all I need. It's all it's going to take and be the best decision they ever made. They won't regret it. They won't look back and say, man, I wish I would have had this kid for another four years. That's the only thing I want to say. Whoever decides that, you know, I'm not even going to say taking a chance on me. Whoever decides they want to invest into me, which they should, you'll be a winner. What is the next step for you? What is your, your short-term goal in terms of your next um, home? Home. Yeah. And then what, what after that? What's the next step in your journey? Well, obviously the next step would be just find the next home for the next two years, go out, go there, ball out, play well, do what I need to do. And then the ultimate goal is the NFL. I mean, I know I can do it. I believe in myself. I always have believed in myself. And that's the reason I'm at where I'm at today is because I've never let anyone else tell me what I can or can't do. I always know what I could do. And I've just, I've always proved people wrong. I've shown it. And I want to continue to show that with my next home these next few years and then in the NFL. Well, I've coached guys in the NFL guys who are starters in the CFL, mm -hmm. the XFL, and the USFL. I know you have the brain to do it. I know you have the body to do it. Mm -hmm. I know you've got the skill set to do it. And I really think physically we're just scratching the surface on what you can become. Yeah. The next college football coach that signs you and hands you the keys to their car is going to win the race. Yeah. Because you've put it all together. You've got a huge heart. You've certainly proven your toughness, your resiliency, your ability to, to recall important information. Yep. You've got all the tools. Like, you, you really do. You have all the tools. I cannot wait to see how this unfolds for you. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. I appreciate it.